Everybody still recording lectures? Yay? No? Other classes? No. Sorry. acting weird there we go all right parasitology number three so we have a uh, big handout hopefully it's a lot of pictures right which you like with a lot of pictures in the handout so uh, definitely worth going in and looking at it uh, in color so you can see the slides uh, that are prepared so Today is amoebas, flagellates, and ciliates. That's our group. So we'll run through, I think there's, I can't remember, I didn't keep count, eight. I think somewhere in there, it seemed about eight. I don't know, somebody's probably already counting, but there's, so there's going to be descriptions of each one, pictures of each one, a little bit about why they're important. Uh, as your handout says, medically important amoebas, flagellates, and ciliates. So these are the ones that we'll encounter um, from time to time. And we have, you know, probably the, the most common one that we will encounter, uh, a flagellate, um, which we'll see coming up, um, and amoebas. So any questions about Friday? So Friday, we um, was thinking about it this morning was it's Friday, but we still will have the test open all day uh, up till midnight for you to complete. So um, depends on how it's like, oh, that's kind of weird. We got a Friday test, that's not cool, right? But if you'll get on it and get it done, you can have your Friday night, you know, don't wait around till midnight to take a Friday night exam. We'll see, we'll see what the trend is this Friday. Um, it's gonna be pretty basic. So it's only three lectures. So it should be a good, easy introduction into uh, parasitology, it's not overwhelming. Um, so I'll put that to, up tomorrow morning or at midnight. I think I'll have it ready for midnight. I'll do it today. So there'll be a review quiz that opens at midnight tonight. And you'll have till Friday, whenever, you know, to take it. I won't close it. Um, it'll have a due date though of tomorrow on Thursday at midnight, even though if you hadn't figured that out yet, the due date can come past. And I do even though it doesn't post your grade, I grade them after the fact. So you still get the highest grade uh, if you continue to study into Friday. So, oh, if you hadn't had me yet, that's what we do. Uh, and the review quiz is very, very important. It guides you to the test. It's in the pools. Uh, you can go over that pool questions over and over. I don't know how big the pool is going to be this time. It may not be very big, um, but if I can get to 50, I'll get to 50. If I can't, uh, exam may be 25, who knows? But I do not give exams that don't hit an even number. I just, I, I never understood a 40 question test. Never understood that because it always half pointed everything. And you might as well just go ahead and give them two points for that answer because that's what you're giving them. Anyway, I always try to keep it where it works out, uh, even for me. Um, so that's the test. That's the test on Friday. We'll cover today's lecture. Tomorrow's lab, we're going to get into looking at some of these um, and bringing them out. So you'll be setting up wet mounts and stains and, and looking at these in real life um, samples. Um, so hopefully that'll help reinforce, even though it's not, oh, here's, here's pictures and things like that. As far as IDing, it will be questions, uh, multiple choice questions on the test. So all my tests are multiple choice. So let's get started. We have uh, E. coli, and if you were in micro last semester, this is not Escherichia coli, okay? So not to confuse you, but sometimes you will see E. coli in a different way, and that way is with Entamoeba coli. Okay, so this is a parasite, it's not a bacteria. Uh, it's not part of the normal floor of the gut, okay? So Entamoeba coli is the first one we want to get clear on. So of course we want to abbreviate it right off the bat just to throw the confusion through the room that E. coli is a non-pathogen 
which closely resembles the one we talked about um, yes, uh, when we have lecture, right? Um, Entamoeba uh, ent histolytica, right? So there's still the amoeba family that we're working our way through. So here's the big trophozoite. It only has one nucleus, it's mononucleated. Peripheral chromatin, remember inside that nucleus is where we are. So on the outer peripheral is the chromatin. It's irregular in size, distribution, and more abundant. The karyosome in the middle, remember that's that center point, you know, pinpoint look to the nucleus. This one's large, irregular, and eccentric. So we don't know if it's gonna be right in the middle. We don't know if it's gonna be all over. The cytoplasm outside this nucleus and in the trophozoite is coarsely granule, numerous vacuoles, no differentiation into the ectoplasma or the endoplasm. Inclusions, again, key, key, key to remember is that it's no red blood cells unless you're where? Which one has red blood cell inclusion? Which is amoeba? It's the lip, thank you, playing along. Um, but we can have bacteria included, we can have yeast included, we can have organic debris included, but no red blood cells. Size-wise, you know, 15 to 50. I think we have a great reference. I like the red blood cell reference. I did note that we did have some students yesterday that hadn't had hemat hematology yet, so that whole size thing may be lost on them. Um, but if you've seen a red blood cell, it's eight to six to eight micrometers in size. These are quite larger, 15 to 50. Motility, very slow, non-progressive, and they have a short, blunt pseudopodia uh, for their foot-like projection that makes it look when they move, uh, looks like they're walking. It does have a cyst form, and the reason I say it that way is because some of the ones we're gonna look at today do not have cyst forms. So I don't want you to get caught up in that there's got to be a trope and a cyst for every one of these. There's going to be one. And we kind of put a little disclaimer in there. We say the cyst has not been identified. So it may be a cyst form that we just have never found um, or where it may be hiding. Um, but for us here, for this one, Entamoeba coli does have a cyst form. The nucleus inside the cyst can be one to eight. So a growing number of, of nucleus is in the cis form of the E. coli up to eight. Uh, the characteristics is like that of the troph. Uh, the cytoplasm is granular. The inclusions in the immature cyst chromatin bars with splintered in it. So not like the cigar that we saw on Friday. Uh, this one would have splinter ends and it's chromatin inside the cyst. There is large glycogen vacuole in the binucleated cyst. Size-wise of the cyst, can be the same size as the trove. A little bit can't be as big, quite as big at 35 cutoff, but 10 to 35 micrometers. So we've seen this already. Uh, the Entamoeba coli nuclei, you're seeing, you know, the different ideas of this chromatin, irregular shape, the karyosome here, you know, eccentric, meaning not in the center always, off center. Um, so it can have various, various variations to it. Here is the comparisons of the tropes and the cyst. Again, you know, this is, this is how we do it, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight nuclei, that's got to be a cyst, right? Up to eight, but it can be four, or it can be eight again, right? Um, little, this is a maturing cyst, and these are tropes up here where we get the, the remnants, as you can see, it looks like remnants of something up there. That's the remnants of the nuclei from previous, but once we get into the, the, the ones by themselves, you're into the trope, that irregular shaped outer edge. So these are drawings, of course, and then of course we have pictures. Sister trope. Trope. How so? Irregular shaped. 
irregular shaped, uh, single nucleus, centric prairiozone, as you can see there, numerous vacuoles, okay, some inclusions, not a red blood cell. Again, cisotrope, trope, okay, vacuoles again, one nucleus, karyosome is centrically placed. Sister trope. Still staying with the trope. Vacuoles. Irregular shaped karyosome is centrically placed. Again, what we got? Vacuoles again, one nuclei, outer edge is getting out of shape. But here, cyst, maturing cyst, it's kind of got a, uh, I always look at this as a insect look to it. Is anybody in following along in the textbook? Maybe, are you? No, I don't know where we're at. Oh, that's where I was seeing if you were on it. So I've got pages 590 to 756. The last one here was on page 627. I want to say we're still in the same section. Intestinal protozoa. There we go. I think we're over. That's whiskey. Anybody at home playing along? Entamoeba coli. I've got four, I've got 642, sorry. Right there. Okay. Um, this, you know, to me, I don't know if you've ever been stung by a wasp coming straight at you. It kind of looks that way, like a wasp is heading straight to me. I don't know if you've ever seen the eyes of a wasp before it got to you. That's kind of what they look like. They're coming at you. Kind of looks have an insect look to it to me. So what is this in the middle? It's glycogen. glycogen, right? What did it say when we had the description? You remember? How did it describe the glycogen? Go back and find it. Da -da -da -da, cyst. Uh, inclusions, immature, chromatin, large glycogen vacuole in the binucleated cyst. So that's how we, we described it. Now we have a picture of it. So this is that large glycogen. Everybody can see it. I think you can see it. Move over here. Large glycogen vacuole binucleated cyst. Okay. E. coli. Again, another look. Cystotroph. Cyst, how many nuclei do we have? Can we count? No, I see at least two each time. One, two, maybe three. One, two, maybe three, maybe four in there. Granular, you see the granular granulization inside that cyst? Hopefully you can. Five nuclei here, so various numbers. It doesn't, you know, it's it's not like it's got to be two, four, six, or eight. Okay, it can be five, it can be seven. Um, chromatin with splintered ends, right here. Still has that cigar a little shake to it, but splintered ends. So it's this. All right. So that was E. coli. Our next amoeba is Entamoeba hartmanni. As we're following along, I think it goes from there to yeah, it's on the next page, 644. 6-4, we'll go backwards. Yeah. Yeah, it's at the bottom. Oh, that's the bottom switches over. There it is, Heart Monty, 644. So very what if if you would say, well, how would you describe this book so far? Very limited on the descriptions of each one of these. So you're not gonna like, oh I got. 15 pages to read about these. It's pretty quick. Um, so it's very easy to go through these chapters and get a quick review on these.
Entamoeba harmoni, morphologically identical to Dyspar, as the camera catches up with me, except for the size, okay? So Entamoeba harmoni, what was the size of Dyspar, you remember? Is it Wednesday? Test on Friday. Since they range 15 to 50. 15 to 50? Look at this. What's, what's the size here? Trophs are less than 12 and the cyst is less than 10. So these are the size of red blood cells. Okay, guys are a lot bigger, morphologically identical. Does anybody, you have the morphologically description of Dysphar there? Did you find? Did that go back? Is sluggish with broad, short pseudopods. Um, I don't have anything. I mean, a uh, dice bar. I mean, here's my description. Find it. On coli, it says that coli is dyspar is oh, here. It is. I got dice bar over here. It was in your, your first notes, right? From Friday. Remember, it's Latin for different. Um, Formerly known non invasive histolytica, the species of amoeba morphologically indistinguishable from histolytica. And it just depends on the, there's no red blood cells. So basically, what I'm bringing that up is Dyspar is morphologically histolytica, and Hartmani is described as morphologically identical to Dyspar except for the size. So histolytica, Dyspar, and Hartmani all are morphologically. Same description except for the red blood cell inclusions and size. Okay, so Hartmani is smaller. Whoops. There we go. Is that the, that's where we are. All right, Endolimax Nana. Love the name, right? Everybody has Nana. Maybe. Anybody have a Nana? Okay, good. All right, so you shouldn't forget this one. Trophozoite, mononucleated. Sanderson says she has a nana too. Uh, the mononucleate, that means one nucleus in the tropes. We're in the trophozoite, single nucleus, no peripheral chromatin, a thin, delicate nuclear membrane. Karyosome is large and irregular shaped. Cytoplasm, numerous vacuoles, kind of sounds like what we had kind of before. Inclusions, bacteria, yeast, organic debris. Again, who are we missing? There we go. Size, again, smaller. Size range, the trope, only five to 12, even smaller than a red blood cell. If you wanna look at it that way, average size is seven micrometers in size. So that is a trope. It's gonna be very hard to not confuse that with who? Sits, right? Just kind of has that look. It's small, smaller. This is the troph of Endolimax nana. Very fragile nuclear membrane. The karyosome is a lot larger. See that? A lot bigger. The cyst, ovoid shaped nuclei, four pinpoint nuclei. Character like that of the troph, coarsely granular. Chromatin granules, very rare in five to 12 in size. Again, we're in small, for reason the nana name, small. Doesn't nana mean small? I don't know. Does nana mean small? Do you might know Latin from nana? Nano means Nano is small. Close. Just trying to make it connect somehow to small. So here's a cyst. Ovoid, so it's not circular. Okay, pinpoint nuclei, one, two, three, four. So you got a good look yesterday of stool finally, right? Did a wet prep yesterday with iodine stain. Now you're, that, hopefully, that was kind of like a run through to kind of get a feel for, hey, there's nothing here. Are we gonna, are we gonna call anything positive that we may or may not know exactly what we're looking for? Now you're gonna start seeing samples with things in them. 
So hopefully that helped yesterday to get a run through on pseudos and other debris and other junk that ends up in the feces of a diarrheal patient. But then we're going to be looking for things like this. Okay. So the comparison, if you've done your diffs, right? Some people like to do red blood cells with 40. But if you're looking for inclusions, right? You were taught last semester, hopefully, to go on down and go higher power so you could definitely see. Um, but you got to find these first scanning. I don't want you to run to oil right off the bat and go, now I'm going to scan and start looking. I want you to get a feel for what does it look like as I'm panning through, getting an overview of that side to side of that cover slip. Cyst, pinpoint nuclei, one, two, three. So basically when you get a cyst, you see multiple nucleus, all right? That's gonna be key for us. All right, so that was Endolimax Nana. And we're moving over to Iotamoeba, sorry, but Skilly. Again, still in the amoeba family. That's the name. Trophozoite, very similar to the appearance of Enana. The nucleus, thin, delicate nuclear membrane, no peripheral chromatin. So you would think the peripheral chromatin is going to give you this fragile look. You know, the nuclear membrane is not as thick not as strong, it doesn't look. Karyosome, large, irregular shape, so not pinpoint. Karyolymph space, okay? Small chromatin granules give it a dirty appearance. So inside the, the nucleus, karyolymph space is dirty in appearance. The cytoplasm outside the nucleus, numerous vacuoles, inclusions again, bacteria, yeast, organic debris. So hopefully you're getting the idea that these things are living, okay? They're, they're ingesting bacteria, yeast, and organic debris. Hope we hadn't missed that yet. Uh, size range, a little bigger, four to, could be bigger. I'll say four to 20 is a pretty big range when we're thinking six to eight for a red blood cell. It could definitely be smaller definitely be bigger. Average size, a little bit larger than a red blood cell. There he is. That's the troph. Large karyosome, thin nuclear membrane, granular karyolymph space, vacuoles out here. The cyst, one nucleus. Huh. No, now you're going you know, to mess me up, all right? We've been talking about all these multiple nucleated cysts, and you got us looking for that. You got us on that path, and now you're going to throw uh, a skilly at us and say that it only has one nuclei in the cyst. Karyosome, again, is still a large, irregular shape, but eccentric. Karyolymph space contains chromatin granules, but there is a saving grace to identifying the cyst of Ido amoeba, which is flower basket. Does everybody know a flower basket? Have you seen a flower basket? Right? Flower basket, round, has a big handle, right? Can you carry it? Everybody seen a flower basket? Some, some people last year had not seen a flower basket. They, did, they were unaware what a flower basket was with flowers stuck in it, okay? So we're not worried about the flowers per se, but we're worried about this look of a handle, okay, leading to a basket. And we'll see that just briefly. Coarse granular cytoplasmal, large glycogen vacuole in the cyst. So if you see that large glycogen vacuole, that'll be our help. Nine to 12, and there we go. So I hope you can see the flower basket. You gotta turn it on its side a little bit, hold the handle. Flowers are down here in the basket where the nuclei is, where that big karyosome is located. This is the glycogen vacuole that gives it the hand basket look. 
glycogen vacuole, grab the handle, flowers in the bottom of the basket. Okay, concentric placed, carry his own, not right in the center. Got two down here. Again, beautiful. Got the trichrome stain. Glycogen vacuole, grab the basket handle, carry it off. Okay, so here is a side by side comparison of Entamoeba banana, right? Iota, uh, yeah, Entamoeba banana. Right, is that what the name? Everybody with me on E Nana? No, it's not Entamoeba. What is it? Endolimax Endo Nana. Thank you. And then I, but Skilly, is what? Iota Amoeba. Okay, so got it. Even though we're abbreviating those, it's so easy to get them mixed up with the other E's, the other I's. Are there other I's? But there's definitely other E's. So again, troph or cis, what do you think? Cis, because that large glycogen vacuole, yes, three. Three and four are Iotamoeba Baskillis cyst. Okay. It says one and two. Here's one and here's two. These are the tropes. Okay. Very, very hard. But you know what? If it is but skilly, you got the large glycogen flower basket. If it's a cyst for nana, you got multiple nucleuses, okay? That's going to be key for you to keep up with. And I hope you're getting that. I think we're doing it at a great pace. I think you should be catching on to those descriptions because that's all today really is, is just description. All right. So we move from the amoebas to the flagellates. And this one is hopefully, I mean, I don't think you, I, I would be, I would wager that you've never heard of anybody with any of those infections that we just talked about, correct? E. coli infection, yeah, the other one, uh, Nana. Those are not common to us as medical professionals and hey, we see patients all the time with these kind of parasitic infections. But now we're running into the flagellates and the flagellates definitely can appear out of nowhere in your ER um, and we're going to see that with our first one. All right, so we're going to start with Giardia, duodenalysis, or duodenalysis, is that it? Duodenal. Bliss, help me out. Okay. Duodenalis, okay. Giardia, G. Duodenalis. It's ingested from contaminated food and water. Beavers, okay. Beavers, muskrats, water rats infects our backpackers and mountain climbers because they go out into these areas and they go, you know, that's such a beautiful stream of water. It is actually looks refreshing. It's not muddy like the river water or the pond water that I'm used to seeing. It must be great to drink because I'm hot and thirsty and they get down there and they pick it up and they drink it. Hopefully that's not you, but that could be an inexperienced camper. Could be a kid, right? What kid wouldn't put their hand, they've seen it in the movies, on TV, put your hand in the stream, get a sip of water when you need it because it looks so good, right? And they end up ingesting infected water. So contamination of water supply with sewage, and you don't maybe think about this, but animals and their poop get washed into these streams and that's how it ends up there. Runoff, or actually like a beaver living in the water itself, living in the pond. So here is giardiasis, Giardialysis from CDC's Giardia Intestinalysis. And I know you're thinking, well, hey, you're, you're moving away from the name we just started with, okay? But intestinal should tell you that it is from the duodenal. 
area of the small intestine. Okay, so we can hopefully see that. This is the large intestine and this is the small intestine. Okay, so if you ingest with contamination of water with the infected cyst, so we ingest that and we ingest it and then once it gets down into the intestine the trophozoites are also passed in the stool they do not survive in the environment so we're pooping out trophozoites and cysts okay, of our flagellate here the good thing about giardia is is that you know it's there because it, the way we say it in the description is that when you find it on a slide in a wet prep, it is usually looking back at you, whether it be in a cyst form or trophozoite. So I always look at these as eyes. And I know that's kind of weird to think about, but to me, that's the easiest way to think about it. Is the troph is always going to be looking back at you. Uh, cyst has multiple, again, nuclei. So the troph would have that binucleus. Cysts would have multiples. You can see the folds of all these little descriptions we're going to have of the, the structures. So basically that's the ongoing cycle of infection. So if we take the poop sample and we look at it, uh, we can definitely diagnose them with either cyst of giardia or tropes of giardia. So the trophozoite again is binucleated, the two eyes looking at me. It has flagella. It has four pair. So four pair of flagella equals eight flagella. Uh, the axonemus here, the intracytoplasmic portion of the two caudal flagella, flagella, sorry. The medium body, two curved rods below sucking disc. So these have a sucking disc for attachment to the mucosa lining of your intestine. Size wise, nine to 21. They're not that big. Motility, oscillating falling leaf look to them. So if you had them in your wet prep, all right, and we see these troughs, they're not gonna be doing this. What they're gonna be doing is just kind of going with the flow, okay? So we can see that, we can see that movement of the Giardia troph. So here is another Giardia, Giardia lamblia. You may be more familiar with that name and we'll tell you why in a little bit. But here's our two binucleate eyes looking back at us. Here's our uh, four pairs of flagella, one, two, three, four for movement. You can see those kind of all in the cyst or kind of all wound up inside the cyst. Here's all the descriptions of each one. We have an anterior, we have posterior, we have caudal, we have this ventral groove, we have medium bodies, we have the adhesive disc here, that sucker. Um, let's see, kinetosomal complex. So it's pretty obvious when you see a Giardia. I don't think you'll confuse it. Okay. I think that's a high magnification there. Here's that sucker. Here's the eight flagella. Electron, micron, micrograph. Here's a whole family in your intestinal, attached to the intestinal wall. Here's a trove stain, trichrome stain, two. Okay, the flagella don't stain very well. But definitely, you know, outside the troph itself, it's pretty easy to see. The cyst, one to four nuclei, cytoplasmic structures, the flagella, twice the number seen in the troph, so you have 16 flagella in the cyst. Four median bodies, uh, size eight to 14 micrometers. So again, here are our median bodies here, the cyst wall, four nuclei. Here's what the cyst looks like with an iodine stain. 
Again, not the best, not the perfect. Oh, there's four. Remember, it could be one to four. Two here. Is that a cyst or a trove? Right? It gets a little harder when it looks like that. All right. So the disease is beaver fever. For duo the mouse, the wide mouse. Uh, small and large intestine, both in the area. We have this statorrhea, which is a fatty diarrhea, foul smelling, of course. Mechanical damage to the villi in the intestine leads to malabsorption syndrome. So they'll say, oh, you know, who hadn't been compared to losing weight and getting confused of having a tapeworm or some kind of infectious of a parasite, right? So malabsorption. So to diagnose, we're gonna use stool. Uh, we can use a duodenal aspirate Direct wet mount, concentrate, trichrome stain, a permanent smear to diagnose it. So what I wanted to make, just point out that we did have several different names of Giardia there. Um, and they're all associated with the same characteristics as far as not what where they are and what they're causing, um, but they're in the intestine. They come from contaminated water with feces, uh, but there are different species of Giardia, and I think you saw three of those. You saw Lamblia, you saw Duodenalysis, and there was one more, wasn't there? One more Giardia in the description names and the labels. I don't think we have them all listed. But the book I'm thinking does. I see flagellates, I see wad analysis. I think that's it. Maybe the book doesn't, maybe just our slides. Okay. Oh, it was the on the CDC's thing of intestine analysis or whatever it was. Remember? That's where that other one was. All right. Dientamoeba fragilis. Fragile being in that back end of that name, and we're going to see why it's named that. So it, it talks about this one. I think in my notes, it talks about how this was, I think it had a, a description change in this one. On the wrong description here. I do my other notes. Oh well. Yeah, oh here they are. This is it. No. What's up with my other notes? Now I can't find it. I just want to point out there was one there's a description. I can't remember if it's in here. Here it is. All right, prejudice. Yes. Okay. And I don't know if this. I don't think this was in your note about it, but until recently, what I, the point I was wanting to make is until recently, this organism was thought to be an amoeba. So, giant amoeba, fragilis kind of throw you off that it is a flagellate, right? But Despite the lack of flagella, electron microscopic revealed that the parasite is a flagellate. So I know that's the confusing part. That's why I wanted to make sure I got that straight. So the dient amoeba fragilis is not a amoeba. It is a flagellate. Okay. It's transmitted via the helmet egg. No cyst stage has been demonstrated. So that's kind of like that asterisk that we talk about with this one. Transmission is fecal contamination of food and water. It's associated with the human roundworm, Ascarius lumbricoides, and the pinworm. And that was the one most of my notes talked about was the pinworm infection 
being maybe where the cyst is. Okay, so the interobious uh, vermicularis infection of pinworm is associated with dye into amoeba fragilis infection. The troph, remember we don't have a cyst or we have them in isolated cyst. 60 to 80% are binucleated. The other 20 to 40% are mononucleated. So this is the troph, no peripheral chromatin. The karyosome, four to eight chromatin granules, which is fragmented, thus that's how it gets its name. So the karyosome here is gonna look fragmented. Size-wise, seven to 12. Again, no cyst stage has ever been demonstrated. Diarrhea, abdominal pain, blood, and mucus in that diarrhea. Demonstrate direct wet mount, actively modal trophs. Trichrome stain gives a high percentage of binucleated forms with a fragmented nucleus. Dientamoeba fragilis, the mono here, the bi here. Remember, there's no cyst stage, so don't confuse this with, ever with a cyst, a dientamoeba fragilis, fragilis. Fragmented karyosome. Okay. And then we go to another flagellate, and this is probably the most common one we will ever encounter with our trichomonas vaginalis. Sexually transmitted infection from males to females. Males are usually the asymptomatic carrier that infect their sexual partner with trichomonas vaginalis. Trophozoite, single nucleus located in the anterior end of the body. Four anteriorly located flagella. It has an axle styli, which is a sharp pointed slender rod which extends through the body and protrudes posteriorly. The costa is a short and extends halfway down the body. And it has an undulating membrane, the same length as the costa. So that's kind of the description of the structure. Five to 15, so when we look at it under a urinalysis, that's where I see them all the time. In the urine, it looks like a large uh, white blood cell that's actually moving and eating. Usually these are ingesting with bacteria from a UTI. Um, and they have active bacteria in them. So you will see that movement of the bacteria inside the body uh, with, a under, with an eating stylus coming out and grabbing things to eat. And then they kind of shake and jerk around in a non-directional motility. No cysts have been demonstrated. So here we go. So here is our flagella. Here's our nucleus, here's our undulating membrane. And they, you can actually watch them actively eat in the urine. Again, our four, terrier, our four anterior flagella here, our single nucleus, our costa that runs here with an undulating membrane that's attached to the costa, posterior axostyle here, comes down the end. And this trophozoite is very, very frequently encountered in our urines, in our ERs. I tried to keep, some, most of the time I'll try to capture these once I find a urine with them and I always tried to bring them to class and I tried always to keep them. Somehow I would incubate them, I would refrigerate them, but I never could get them to stay active long-term out of the body. So as you say, you know, when we talk about the fragility of the troph outside the body, it's not, it's, it's true. Because I've tried over and over and over to keep this thing um, in a sample for us to look at under the microscope and see the activity. But unless I have a fresh urine, I can't keep the trophs going. So this is, um, here they are out here. And usually when you're looking at it under the scope, I know we're, we're running into our time, but we'll, we've, we've got time to finish. I think so. Uh, we have a few more, but this one's probably the most important. So give me like, y'all got, can you give me five minutes? Yay? Yay? Okay, I promise I won't take more. Um, but, the, but this is in the urine. 
And what you do is you see it and you're like, ah, did I just see something move? And then you go back and you go, yeah, I did see something move. So sometimes you gotta be careful. Sometimes when the, the light, like if it's a refrigerated urine and you get the light of the microscope, starts heating it up a little bit and then it'll start moving a little bit more. So look for movement inside the feces with any of these tropes, but also in the urine. So we have them in the vagina, bladder occasionally, urethra most common, vaginitis, the itching, burning. We like, um, sometimes it looks like they're doing a happy dance at the ER when they're waiting to be checked in. Uh, it looks like a very unpleasant um, situation. Usually it brings them to the ER. Bladder, dysuria, polyuria, urethra, asymptomatic in males, epididymis and prostate can be infected. Um, even though it's not a, a reportable disease, it's estimated 7 million new infections occur each year, doubling the number of chlamydia and gonorrhea, which is reportable. So vaginitis, women, TB, T, uh, the TB is trichomonas vaginalis. We diagnose it with a vaginal discharge or urines, direct wet mount. We can stain it. You can also culture it with a gold standard for diagnosing. It's widely used uh, culture in, in pouch, allows direct inoculation, transport, and culture. Maybe that's what I've been needing to do. I've been needing to culture it when I find it to bring it in for us to look at. So I'm gonna try that next time I get one. You can do an enzyme immunoassay dipstick test in vaginal secretions, get your 10 minute result. To affirm, we do nucleic probe tests with trichomonas, gardenella, and, and candida albicans. All right, what I will do is I will pause here, which we've run out, and um, we just had three more. We'll just say there's names, Pentatrichomonas hominis, it is a non-pathogen in the fecal contamination. So it looks like trichomonas vaginalis and hominis. Got a comparison. We have chylomastix mesnili, non-pathogen, fecal contamination. So these last three we're, we're hitting on just briefly. This one has a shepherd's crook. Okay, so that's why we wanted to say it here is because when we, we ID this one, We'll see it as a shepherd's hook. So this is the shepherd hook of chylomastic mesnili coming in here. And we'll pick these back up when we start looking for them. Okay, well. And then we'll just say the ciliates for beginning of lab tomorrow. All right. So you don't have lecture on Friday? No, no lecture on Friday. Test day, no lecture. I will see you tomorrow for lab, and then we'll come back and uh, have test on Friday, and I'll see you back in lab on Tuesday. So no class on Thursday, you're correct. I'm going to stop the share, say bye to Zoom.